of blatant hypocrisy. Uh, the monarchies are pretty good. They never said they were going to have elections. They never gave you a chance to vote. Uh, they never said that they had democracies. The neo mammoth regimes all said, oh, let's have an election. And then everyone had to vote for the, the, the sultan of the moment. So um, the citizens and the, and the uh, monarchies uh, have not become yet as, as jaundiced about the, um, the corruption of their rulers as those people who were lied to and deceived again and again uh, in fake elections that were being held in the neo mammal regimes. Okay, that is what I have to say, and I'll be happy to entertain any discussion of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bullitt. This was a wonderful discussion on uh, the basic question of, most important question of legitimacy. We've been discussing the economy. Is it, uh, you know, uh, social movements of organizations, uh, different styles of uh, protest, protest movements, etc. So I think this was very useful and eye-opening for many of us. Um, I'd like to pose the first question on uh, this categorization of neo mamluk states and then the monarchies. And then you pointed to Turkey as the example, which <laughs> there was a military tutelage regime for, for a long time. But maybe you could expand upon that? I don't know if you need to. Um, Turkey was a neo mamluk state under Mustafa Kemal. Um, it was a state run by military officers. <clears throat> it was risk averse. I mean, it's very important. And what distinguishes Turkey from the fascist states of Europe at the same time was that is what's encapsulated in the slogan, um, uh, peace at home, peace abroad. Mussolini would never have said that. He would say, peace at home, let's attack somebody. Or Hitler <laughs> or uh, other, uh, other fascists. Um, but in fact, uh, the Turkish army uh, was not seeking <coughs> to, to conquer the neighbors. Um, they were seeking to build a state in which, in fact, the Turkish army would be peculiarly honored. Um, I've never looked into the details, but I'm told that in the elementary school curricula in Turkey, you have three -year, uh, a three-year course on um, um, respect for the army. Um, and the army, of course, was committed to the principles of Islamic Turkism. Um, but it was just as important that the army became deeply embedded in the economy. You know, the retirement funds and things like that. I mean, the Turkish army is not simply a, a war fighting body, but it's an economic um, <coughs> entity of, of great importance. Um, when you had coups, it's not at all clear to me that those coups were, um, were not in substantial measure um, uh, inspired by a sense among the senior military officers that their position in the country was at risk. Uh, whether it was risk because of Islam or at risk because of, of communism or at risk because of what. But having the, the, the special rank and the privileges of the military at risk, I think, um, led to a basically a class response uh, on the part of the, of the officer corps. And I think maybe now the officer corps said, no, we can coexist. And certainly uh, the AK party says, we can coexist. They have found a, at least for the time being, a modus for that being. The Arabs, I think, are going to use Turkey as their model. They won't say so because Arabs uh, despise Turks and Turks despise Arabs. But, um, but I think, in fact, they're going to, to see that, um, that when you have a powerful um, social formation of uh, economically entrenched military officer families, uh, you can't move real quickly. You can't change things terribly deeply because they still have the, uh, their hand on the brake if you try and do that. So they're going to have to find a, uh, no, ways and means of working out uh, new deals. And it's, um, 
I think Turkey is an excellent example. I, I must say that I've, I've been wondering if Ataturk had had a son, whether we had, would have seen, first of all, whether he would have been a general, or whether he would have, he would have become an ophthalmologist, or a pharmacist, or a um, um, elementary education specialist, because in the Arab world, the sons of generals go, you know, aspire to having positions of high respect in the civil society, not in the military, as opposed to generals in the West whose sons become generals. Um, but if Ataturk had, had a son, would it have been like uh, Bashar al-Assad or uh, the son of Gaddafi or the son of Mubarak? Uh, would he have tried to pass it on? Thank fortune, he did not, and Turkey was able to um, to get away from that notion of a uh, of passing the succession on within the family of the great leader. Uh, I think that. Um, what you had in Turkey under Ataturk uh, was a lot better for Turkey than what you have had in most of the neo mamluk regimes uh, since the 1950s. Uh, and yet, there were also problems there. I mean, Turkey went through a series of economic uh, stages that were not always uh, beneficial, um, but never became quite as desolate as the, as the Arab world. Turkey's One more question before I open it to questions from the audience. Um, you highlighted uh, Al Qaeda's sort of delegitimizing uh, influence on the Arab regime, but it seemed that it sounded like the U.S. kind of fell into that trap, if you will. What are, what do you see U.S.'s role in right now, looking forward? Um, well, I think, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a very good issue. I think that um, yeah, the U.S. properly um, sees the world, as most states do, as uh, a realm where policy decisions should be based on, on enlightened national interest. We do what we think would be good for the United <laughs> States. So we set up certain goals. Um, for example, security of uh, cheap oil, um, you know, protection of the state of Israel, uh, during the Cold War, denial of Soviet uh, penetration. These were very rational American goals uh, that we would push with varying degrees of success. Um, those goals um, have evolved. We now clearly have uh, a goal of uh, isolating and hopefully uh, destroying uh, the regime in Iran. And we have a goal of um, uh, alerting the world to the threat of Islamic radicalism and deploying the necessary uh, counter-terrorist forces anywhere in the world to counter that threat. These are new American national goals. And I'm not going to quarrel with policies that arise essentially from domestic political necessities and uh, appraisals of the American national interest. But these new goals are uh, tremendously um, uh, destructive of the uh, legitimacy of those states that, that adopt the American uh, view of things. And I think that Ironically, America's success in foreign policy is what has destroyed these regimes. It has undermined them. Um, uh, I think one of the reasons Syria is standing up better is that Syria was the one that did not uh, play ball with the Americans and still has some credibility domestically. But, uh, you know, when the Yemeni government says, okay, we'll use your, your predator strikes and your um, intelligence to destroy Al-Qaeda on uh, the Arabian Peninsula on our soil, or when Gaddafi gives up his uh, nuclear weapons in order to, you know, to be welcomed back into the Euro-American universe. Uh, these are delegitimizing uh, states, uh, delegitimizing events. So the question is, should the U.S. adopt a policy that is directed less at the short-term American national interest 
and more at the long-term um, uh, fostering of a uh, of new types of government in a very uh, shaky part of the world. This is what in the Bush administration is called the Freedom Agenda, which really didn't amount to anything more than talk in, in the long run. <coughs> but um, supposing the United States adopted a policy saying that we will strongly support um, regimes that have constitutions that allow uh, parties of every stripe to participate, that have uh, elections, that have international monitors to ensure that they are uh, free and fair, that, um, uh, that favors participation of women, that favors um, uh, economic uh, development and addressing of, of social needs. And we can say, we want to support these regimes uh, coming into being over the next 10 years. And if one of them happens to elect an Islamist party to the majority in parliament, we will not have a fit. And that has been the, the issue of so many people, particularly here in Washington. What would we do if the, if the Muslim Brotherhood won in Egypt? And the, the, the good answer is, um, well, you know, just you know, man up and swallow that because it's um, that it's likely to happen. It's also likely that the Muslim Brotherhood will prove not a very good government and fall in the next election. Or alternatively, it might prove pre 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 to be a good government and uh, and be continued. But it isn't fundamentally the American uh, the American uh, interest to uh, to situationally oppose all Muslim political activities. But that, in the short term, would be the American national interest growing out of 9-11 and the rampant Islamophobia since that time. And I think it would be a, a tragedy if that were to continue to govern, uh, to, to govern our policies, because the, uh, the likelihood is that you'll have Islamic parties in every, uh, in every new constitutional electoral system, and some of them will will win from time to time. Now, ever since 1992, we've had this phrase, one land, one vote, one time, with the idea that, well, if, the Mus if a Muslim party got elected, they would turn it into an Islamic republic and a dictatorship. Now, it's interesting. It is true that you have people who get elected who then subvert their, their constitutions and turn their countries into dictatorships. And when you look comparatively at instances where this has happened, uh, what you find is that the people who are elected are almost always either generals or heads of nationalist parties. There isn't any example of a Muslim uh, activist being elected and then turning the country into a dictatorship. Um, people say that Iran, that those cases in Iran, but in Iran you had a revolution. We haven't had a revolution in the Arab Spring. Um, so the phrase, one man, one vote, one time, implying that somehow Muslim activists were more likely to be dictators than army generals or nationalist um, uh, ranchers, uh, this was simply a propaganda thing. But many people uh, believed it. The protection, oddly enough, against an Islamic dictatorship is precisely the officer corps that is still there. Um, they can stage a coup. There's, it's going to be very difficult for, say, if the Muslim Brotherhood were elected in Egypt, for them to suddenly come up with a dozen four-star generals uh, who had the training and the respect of the military to take over control of the military. Because the military is about going in that direction, and yet the generals are still going to be there. Um, uh, it's, it simply is not a huge threat, and when you see, um, uh, oh, there's an article in the paper, I think, today in the Times about um, Abdul Munam Abdul Wudu, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, saying that he intends to run for president, but not on the Muslim Brotherhood platform. 
because he thinks that he, it should not be a religious government. Um, um, he's quite a credible person. I, I, I've met him, and um, he's clearly as a senior figure in the Muslim Brotherhood. But he clearly sees that uh, the Brotherhood, as the Brotherhood, is unlikely to win the election, whereas he, as an individual who, who derives from the Brotherhood, uh, may have a chance. Well, now, is there anyone we can think of in the Muslim world who comes from a religious background but is not specifically a religious um, ruler but can be elected popularly and satisfy uh, some religious values and yet be accepted by secular people? I can think of someone who might fall into that category. And I think that that is an unspoken model. And that uh, Mr. Erdogan is um, going to go down not only as an important politician in Turkey, but perhaps one of the most important model politicians for the entire region. And this is not to say that, that there's a neo ottoman empire in the office, just talking about him personally. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, what do you think it, um, is happening now with the administration refusing to come out strongly against what's happening in Bahrain, not mentioning Saudi Arabia? Um, do, you think, do you think there's a, a risk there of losing a certain amount of legitimacy by, by not taking a strong stand there when we have more to do with Bahrain than yeah, I, mean, I didn't talk about Bahrain. Clearly there's been substantial unrest in Bahrain. But there you have the majority Shiite population, minority Sunni Indian population. And the, the terms of the demonstration has been rather different uh, than in the, in the other states. Plus the, um, the, the likelihood that it turned out that it would be a reality that if things became uh, <coughs> too hot in Bahrain, the Saudis would step in. Um, basically, um, well, I, uh, maybe a dozen years ago, I had a conversation with a member of the Bahrain ruling family when he was a graduate student at Columbia. I said, you know, given the demographic issues, ultimately your, you know, your family is going to have to either share power with the Shiites or sort of turn over the country to the Saudis. He said, well, that's what we're going to do. I said, what are you going to do, share with the Shiites? I said, no, no. Uh, we would never share with the Shiites because they are, you know, brutish animals who simply breed children in order to outnumber us, and they're just uh, beneath contempt. Uh, we would give up the sovereignty, uh, sovereignty and turn over the country to the Saudis rather than share with the Shiites. And, um, and even though he was um, personally, I would say, oh, pretty stupid, um, I think he did represent a substantial segment of feeling within the Bahrain family. I don't think the United States feels that it has significant leverage uh, anywhere in the Gulf to, uh, to do anything that the Saudis do not, uh, do not tacitly approve of, maybe in Qatar. But then, you know, uh, there are so few people in Qatar, a popular demonstration would be four people out on the street. And you know, we have more, on any given day, we can legitimately put more army personnel into Qatar than the entire native population of the country. So we can't count that very much. But by and large, I think uh, we will um, let the Bahrainis uh, deal with their issue and, if necessary, um, uh, relocate um, our. Uh, our naval force. I, you know, prior to um, the Iran-Iraq uh, war, uh, the U.S. naval uh, deployment in the Gulf based on Bahrain, it wasn't based on, on, on visiting rights in Bahrain, but it was only, I think, two or three ships. And it was sort of a token presence. And then uh, during that war, there was a, an incident where a, um, an Iranian <coughs> pilot was defecting to Saudi Arabia, and he came flying across the Gulf, just a, sort of at wave top level, and it turned out he was heading directly toward the American flagship. And then as soon as he saw the American ship, he went straight up and flew over and landed in Saudi Arabia, 
And uh, so I talked to the Admiral, um, and he said, you know, I called the air defense people in Saudi, and I said, to, you know, you have Hawk batteries. You know, did you mobilize? Did you try and intercept this guy? And they said, uh, well, no, they weren't ready for it. It was in the midst of the war. And I said, well, how long would it take you to, to mobilize your air defenses in, you know, against Iranian overflights? I said, you know, about a week. Because we have to find the people, uh, then we have to persuade them to come to the base. They might be out hunting, they might be having a family event, and we have to retrain them. <laughs> um, uh, the Saudi uh, military, uh, matter of fact, the whole Gulf military picture was so pathetic at that time that we came in and said, we have to replace the military for the entire region. It's with Saddam Khan, it's not really clear that we have to have uh, vast military resources in the Gulf. Iran is not going to attack across the Gulf. Um, it's very unlikely that there's going to be a war in that, in that area. So uh, redeploying to Djibouti or someplace um, might make sense and let the Bahrainis stew in their, uh, in their terrible uh, sectarian uh, uh, pressure cooker. Well, first of all, Hotel, thank you for yet another intriguing view on, on this subject. Uh, I would just add that uh, if not a trick, had a son, uh, he probably would have wound up running yeah. uh, rather than a uh, you, you did mention a number of potential uh, uh, solutions here, one of which was the, the business of having the, the military in places like Egypt uh, stabilized financially. And in that respect, don't you think that the Turkish uh, model of OYA, the retirement fund, has been in place for a number of years, which has really served in many ways to give a, a good deal of comfort to senior staff in their retirement and, and having them also uh, become more in tune or congruent with the interests of the economy. Uh, do you think that might, that might be a way out uh, yep. of the uh, I, I think that that, uh, that OYAC would be a, a plausible model. But, but right now, I think the, the individual officer families have embedded themselves in specific industries or specific economic enterprises that are not really devoted to preserving their pensions, but rather to, uh, to um, sort of feathering the, the, the immediate economic interests of family and, and, and friends. Uh, and when you see, uh, there's a website. Uh, it, it's, it's James, only it's not, uh, uh, not James, uh, James All the World Weapons. It's a website devoted specifically to uh, to exposing the family connections of Ali Abdel Saleh in Yemen, and it lists all of his relatives and what they own and what they do. It's just just striking the penetration of some of these families, and, and um, but they have done it more through uh, through having a businessman who is in league with with a top family rather than have it be just the officers themselves. I think there's a, I think in Turkey, the, perhaps the fact that the economy was developing under a statist system instead of under the, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of economic opening that we started with Sadat in the Arab world, uh, it may be that Turkey was more easily um, rationalized than in the Arab world. Time will um, Kathy Cosman, if you if you could cast your net a bit wider, because it's really fascinating, um, to discuss areas like Azerbaijan and Soviet Central Asia or post-Soviet Central Asia from a point of view of sources of legitimacy and what you were saying about uh, the potential for it taking 50 years, say. In, in the Arab uh, countries to overcome the military legacy, so to speak. 
how, how long will it take the, the, that part of the world to overcome the post-party legacy? Uh, it's, it's, okay. Yes. So the central part of your argument was this idea that the modern nominal republics are neo mamluk states. Two of those states actually started out as monarchies and they were overthrown by Hughes Green, including Iraq. So when you talk about this phenomenon of neo mamlukism is it specifically simply the organization of government or is there sort of more fundamental causes which lead both to the nominal republican political nature of the systems and the neo mamluk phenomenon? Yes. Okay, uh, Central Asia. Um, the, the huge difference that you get uh, in Central Asia from the Middle East is the um, uh, the Soviet institutional structures that were not specific to individual republics. Um, I recall uh, having an interview with a Spetsnaz officer in Uzbekistan, and. Um, is after the mm -hmm. Afghanistan war, and uh, and saying, you know, now you're a Russian, but you're in the Uzbek army, and he said, we're all the Red Army. No, we trained together, we studied the same doctrines, we shared the weapons, we shared everything. We don't, we were uh, in Afghanistan together. Uh, we are not, you know, I, I'm I'm not, you know, uh, an officer who is here to defend Uzbekistan, basically. Okay. So, you, so you don't have uh, an officer corps that's the same. And the same thing with, with, with the uh, internal security. Uh, the KGB person I, I talked to at the same time in Uzbekistan said, well, the really important issue for the KGB veterans is um, transport, uh, the, uh, whether they can move their pensions from one state to another. If they serve in Uzbekistan, can they go back to Russia and still collect their pension uh, from the Uzbek government? And, and of course, the party was the big one. Uh, the party was throughout the Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union. So the, uh, the legacies there that are, uh, that are not, um, are, are legacies that did not fundamentally recognize the separation of these republics in, in, in independent states. So I think that you have uh, legacies that have to be dealt with. But I, I don't think that they are comparable in the, uh, to the legacies that you had, uh, uh, that you had in, the, uh, uh, in the Arab world. So I, I, don't, I don't see much comparison. I can't make any estimate about how, how long uh, things may take there. Uh, on the issue of the, of the Mamluk groups, uh, yes, you had a kingdom in Libya, you had a kingdom in, uh, in uh, in Iraq, um, basically, uh, the Iraqi kingdom was a neo mamluk state. I mean, almost all the cabinet members were ex-members of the Ottoman officers of the Ottoman army. They'd gone to the um, to the uh, military high school in Baghdad. Then they'd gone to the war college. They fought in World War One, and now they were uh, running uh, an Arab state. They happen to have a king. Um, why did they have a king? They had a king because the British were controlling everything and the Brits liked kings. They thought that was a cool thing. They wanted a king in Egypt, they wanted a king in Jordan, they wanted a king in Iraq because, you know, that was just great. should have a king. Uh, it's silly, silly. But, but fundamentally, um, these places were, uh, were already neo um, uh prior to, uh, to the coups that took over. Uh, Libya is perhaps the exception, and Libya is uh, is really uh, an outlier in some of these things I've been talking about uh, because uh, the legitimacy of King of Greece uh, came from very was very different from the legitimacy of of a King Abdullah in uh, in, in Iraq or uh, or in uh, Jordan or uh, King Faisal in Iraq. Um, I do have some problems with the. Uh, 
why the Jordanian regime has not, more, has not proven more fragile. Um, it seems to me like it should. But so the, the, the monarchies I'm talking about are ones that have claims to, dy to dynastic um, uh, legitimacy. That uh, the Mamluks, uh, the Neo-Mamluks really, uh, really can't claim. And um, uh, why a dynasty means something uh, to people, I don't know, but I think that it, that it does. Uh, in, in Oman, um, the Sultan um, genuinely seems to be uh, white, and people, even though he has no son, and there will have a son because he's gay, um, people expect some member of the family to, to succeed him. And um, he, uh, if you ask people in Oman what will happen when the Sultan dies, and this is, whether you ask an American political officer of the embassy or you ask the Omani, say, oh, the family will, will work out the succession in their traditional way. Well, I know an anthropologist who's a specialist on Oman, and a member of the ruling family came to him and said, now, you're an anthropologist and a specialist on our country. What is our traditional way <laughs> of, of choosing a successor? Because no one has succeeded to the throne in Oman in 200 years without bloodshed. <laughs> so, um, and yet, oh, and, and yet, um, um, the sultan stands up. But if you go to the to the war museum in um, in Muscat, um, the the image of the sultan as a warrior is just spread throughout the thing. So you have the Sultan you know, defeats a, uh, separ a separatist movement in Bofar province. And then you say, uh, did it, the Iranians uh, fly in uh, supplies and warriors to help you fight? No, no, it was a Sultan. You know, he defeated the rebels. I mean, he, he's portrayed as, as, literally as a man on horseback. You see these uh, murals of him attacking enemy uh, things and so forth, and um, uh, he, he's pulled off somehow the business of being a warrior and being a legitimate ruler at the same time. And I, th I think that's, a, that's quite a feat, but uh, he has done it better than, than any of the other Arab uh, uh, dynastic uh, uh, characters, and I think this helped him put down the, the incipient unrest that he had at all. So you have a dual legitimacy. I, I was giving you a broad brush approach. I mean, and the, the details are, are going to be problem in various ways. Uh, Homi, um, no, uh, there is uh, no. There's no one like Homi. Uh, <laughs> the um, uh, first of all, you have the. Um, structure of authority within contemporary Shiism and the structure of authority within contemporary Sunni Islam are radically different. So that, um, let's say, uh, if you had an agreement that came about in the 19th century that there should be what used to be called the reopening of gating which you had, so people could, could adapt Islam to new circumstances, uh, the Sunnis and the Shiites went at this in entirely different ways. The Shiites said, uh, well, we've always basically had that. We have a group of people, maybe half a dozen, maybe now up to 30 or so, who are entitled to change the law because of their uh, rank and their education and their mastery, and they're willing and able to do it, and Khomeini would be one of them. Uh, among the Sunnis, they, they said, <coughs> uh, let a hundred flowers bloom. Uh, and everyone decided that they would say what they thought should be part of Sunni Islam. You know, if you're a Canadian female journalist or a uh, magazine editor in Indonesia or a, um, you know, a blogger in Syria or, uh, you know, some friend of the U.S. government in uh, UCLA or something like that, you know, you simply say, this is what Islam is. And I know this because I'm a Muslim. And and so we end up with, you know, a thousand different notions of Sunni Islam. 
and no, and no imam, no one who stands out uh, in any country um, with that kind of, 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 of clout on an, you know, in, in a, uh, on a localized uh, basis. Um, it is, of course, striking that um, the most prominent uh, Sunni uh, figure, um, Osama bin Laden, had no credentials as a religious leader, um, nor did he claim it. He never said that he was a mufti, he never said that he had a, um, the training to be uh, an imam. Uh, his uh, recruitment video, the two-hour video of the year 2000, never mentions his name. Um, you see his picture, you hear his voiceover, but never mentions his name. And when you get to the part where it's talking about jihad, where you have to have a Muslim state in his interpretation to have a jihad, he says, the Amir al the caliph, is uh, Mullah Muhammad uh, Omar, the head of the Taliban. So he recognized himself as the person who was conducting jihad on behalf of the leader of the Taliban, who was a mullah, whereas he himself, uh, himself was not. And this business of not claiming, in, in Sunni religious political circles, I, I'm not as much specialized in this as some people are, but there, there's a saying of the prophet that says, um, O oh, Abu oh, Rahman, do not seek leadership. And this is cited many, many times. You have it in medieval sources, you have the modern sources. And that's the short form, do not seek leadership. And then the long form is, uh, you get the backstory that uh, the prophet was planning an expedition someplace.